Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Okay, so let's uh, begin the last lecture. Huh? That's what uh, I thought I will call it the last lecture. Uh, so I suppose uh, you have had opportunity to look at the overall syllabus. Uh, my confession is I still haven't made the question paper. Uh, I would make it as late as possible, maybe during my flight tomorrow. <laughs> I will have some time to think about, but today let us uh, discuss about whatever residual doubts that we may have. Huh? Well, um, you know this uh, title uh, that you see here, the last lecture uh, is a book, I do not know how many of you have uh, heard of this book called the last lecture, any of you, no? There was a professor of computer science in Carnegie Mellon University. <coughs> So, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So, he decided to uh, retire, resign and uh, take his family uh, so that they could settle after he dies uh, to some other city. So, the Carnegie Mellon University has a tradition of uh, inviting some of the retiring faculty to come and give a so called last lecture, where they pass on the information to everybody in the campus and it is quite popular. So, this uh, professor's name was Randy Pausch. So, Randy Pausch gave a lecture and uh, it became quite uh, well known all over the world. You may actually even see some book stall here, you, you should be able to pick that book up. Uh, he eventually died, uh, but he gave a very moving uh, lecture. Uh, so, that the title of that book is called The Last Lecture. <laughs> so, uh, as I said, that I will uh, tell you about a uh, uh, few things which are not related to academics today, because we have finished this level. I am more here to uh, answer your residual queries uh, uh, and any comments that you would like to make. Uh, I hope I did not make uh, your the course difficult, uh, but if I have, so I said this is my excuse. So, I fall back on the philosophers of the past, right. Kierkegaard, you know that Danish philosopher, he was uh, extremely brilliant in articulating himself. So, he said that if the task is difficult, uh, there is a reason for it, because you want only the noble hearted people to come out. So, I am happy to see there are at least 40 noble hearted people <laughs> on your uh, uh, population in the IIT Kanpur, those who have braved the whole uh, semester here with me. Well, the idea is not to really uh, make uh, anything easy or difficult, uh, but uh, <clears throat> there are uh, certain things that I wanted to uh, tell you. Uh, I wanted to tell you something about uh, one part, uh, which uh, was asked uh, by one of the students, uh, she is not here, but, uh, but still I should uh, explain to you. <clears throat> This uh, the transfer function for the filters that we discussed about. Um, see, oh, it has a real path and it has an imaginary path. And oh, I think she is here. She asked me the question about uh, these two points. Hmm? That what does uh, uh, the imaginary part of transfer function do? Uh, if you uh, look at uh, the way we have uh, defined uh, transfer function. Uh, transfer function after filtering, if I call that as uh, G, which is defined in the k plane, uh, would be uh, equal to the G of the basic uh, numerical method uh, times the transfer function. So, let us call that as T, that is also a function of k. Now, please do understand that uh, uh, G as well as T both could be complex, right? right? 
So, if they are complex, then you can see um, how you can define, how you can define this. Uh, we are more interested in what? We are more interested in mod g to begin with. To make it neutrally stable, we want mod g to be equal to 1. So, that is the whole idea. So, if I uh, take a mod g, then it should be like this and if uh, g and t are complex, you got to see what will happen. So, now you can see that imaginary part does uh, play a role in uh, deciding whether it is going to be stable or unstable or not, right. So, uh, whether this uh, two statements are definitive or not depends on the transfer function and depends on g real and g imaginary because <clears throat> you will be able to work it out yourself and see what is uh, the contribution of this imaginary part of this transform. But, if you uh, look at uh, E should be uh, strictly real, then you know what this is, right. Uh, G hat of uh, real would be just simply nothing but G of real uh, times that uh, E real. So, we are talking about uh, when E imaginary is identically equal to 0, this is what we get and G hat of uh, imaginary uh, would be simply G of imaginary uh, times uh, T of real. And uh, this is the first part of the uh, task. Uh, the next thing that you uh, really want to find out is the propagation property of disturbances and that is given by beta, well we do not need to really even say J was uh, it is nothing but uh, uh, minus uh, tan inverse of uh, G imaginary uh, by G real, right. Now, if we are uh, talking about uh, the filtered quantity that will be that hmm? and now since uh, in this case for strictly real uh, filter with central filter T imaginary is 0, then you can see this is nothing but uh, equal to beta itself. So, dispersion relation does not change. So, uh, what happens is, uh, when you have a purely uh, central filter, then you can see that uh, it does change the numerical amplification factor, but dispersion property unaltered. That was one of the reasons that we had said that we would like to use those uh, least ordered centered schemes, so that we always uh, retain central uh, uh, attribute of the filter, so that we can, uh, we basically do not uh, tamper with the dispersion property. Okay. So, this is uh, one thing that I wanted to tell you and uh, if there are any other questions on uh, filters, you could uh, ask now, right. Uh, anybody else has any other question? I thought I would uh, clarify. Yeah, they you. Uh -huh. Okay. Ah, uh, let's see. We have this. Uh, you are asking about this. The figure that we have here, that is without a filter. What is this? See, basically, why do you need filter? When filters were originally introduced in uh, late 90s, uh, mid 90s, it was thought that it will take care of uh, numerical instability problem alone. So, it should not actually tamper with the physics of the problem. So, you really want to have a filter working for you in that mode, where it will take care of any numerical instability while uh, being not uh, intruding upon the physics of the problem. It is for that reason that we uh, talked about using the filters, uh, which will actually uh, affect uh, more on high wave numbers say yeah i suppose this 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 is quite revealing you can see that uh, if you compare uh, a second order filter with a six order filter six order filter leaves uh, almost up to this value of kh unaltered right so basically that figure that you saw was uh, something that would tell you that we have computed a case which uh, uh, goes on up to at least this time. This was shown at a time t equal to 47, but you also see that here 
that without filter solution actually breaks down here, it just drops off vertically and then it stops. So, without filter you cannot uh, 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 sort of uh, basically you, you, you cannot uh, compute indefinitely for the reason is this big vortex that you are seeing here that this, this starts growing and this creates a very large gradient vorticity gradient. Okay. A uh, large vorticity gradient means you have a very wide range of k's excited and you also know that as you are going away from the surface of the cylinder, the grid becomes uh, sparser and sparser, I mean it is rarefied. So, what happens is your ability to resolve k also degrades as you go away. So, if you if this vortex was somewhere here, probably you would not have any difficulty. This breakdown in this case, the solid line breakdown is because of this large vorticity gradient, which is in a part of the domain where the grids are not fine enough. Okay? That, so, it is a kind of a numerical instability problem that you are seeing here. So, a sixth order filter would uh, like to rectify the situation, which in this case it did momentarily, that is the last line, the dotted line and you could see it went up to the trough of that uh, curve, but then again it broke down. So, what happened is it, it could delay, it could delay. Whereas, if you apply the second order filter, well it uh, shows you as if it can go on forever, but at what cost? The cost is that this vortex has been completely uh, diffused. This uh, contour value is probably uh, an order or two uh, lower than these vortices that you are seeing there. So, what happens is in a situation scenario like this, you would be able to go on for a long, long time because you have uh, removed numerical instability, but at the same time you may have also tampered with the physics. That is, that is what we saw in this figure. Yeah, uh, something like this. Uh, that a second order filter starts altering the spectrum right from very small value of k, right. So, that figure that you saw, saw there, the sixth order filter and the unfiltered case look similar, because the sixth order filter kept on removing high wave number uh, values of k and that is why it could continue for a little longer, but eventually that also was not adequate to take care. Okay. Yes, any other questions? direction of the filters, uh, that also you can make out that uh, in this particular case, you have two directions uh, to uh, note. One is of course, the radial direction and the other one is the azimuthal direction. Uh, one good thing about the azimuthal direction is, in this direction the geometry is periodic. right? So, you could actually get by using the central uh, stencil for all the points. So, you do not need any closure or anything. So, it would appear as if the azimuthal filter would be preferable compared to the radial filter, right. Because in the radial filter near the boundary I have to create an additional uh, filtering if I uh, want to have a uniformly higher order filter. See if I have a second order filter I do not have to do anything. I could straight away start uh, doing the filter from the point 2 onwards. So, second order filter is uh, no, uh, no issue, but if I want to have a fourth order filter, um, then at j equal to 2 I cannot apply. So, I will have to use some closure. So, that is one uh, thing that you have to realize that um, uh, the filtering that we are performing, we can do either in the theta direction or in the r direction or we can do both. In fact, um, some people tend to think that, uh, well it is not, that is what we also see that look, this is a attribute of a uh, azimuthal filter. What did it do? It actually elongated the vortex in the theta direction. While it was a, actually a circular vortex, it has become elongated in the theta direction. So, to uh, counteract this tendency, some people would tell you that okay, 
you not only apply a fi, uh, filter in the theta direction, you also apply it in r direction. But, what you are doing, uh, the very act of filtering it once, itself has uh, reduced the strength of the vortex. If you would have also added in the r direction, uh, you would have even more uh, loss of the signal. Right? So, in fact, uh, I, I did not uh, want to discuss going on in the lab. We have uh, been working and uh, I think I just finished uh, looking at the work. We have developed a two dimensional filter now, multi dimensional filter. So, instead of uh, doing it once in uh, theta direction and then in the r direction or vice versa, we will just simply apply the filter only in one direction once. So, there are possibilities, we have just worked it out and um, I, we hope that it would be acceptable. I mean, it would be acceptable by the scientific community. So, we, we, that, that is the question of directionality. Uh, but you also know that uh, when we actually filter, let us say in two, di two dimension, let us say this is uh, k 1 h 1 and this is uh, k 2 h 2, then again what I would be doing is, uh, I would be working in a space like this. And if you recall in designing the filter, what did we do? Uh, we actually use the consistency condition plus additional condition depending on the order. Furthermore, to close the system, we also prescribe the transfer function at some point. In one dimension, what was it that we did? At the Nyquist limit, we put the transfer function equal to 0. That gave us the additional equation. So, in two dimension also, you may have to do some uh, how do you do it? That is the thing. Uh, this is, let us say, in say one of the direction, it goes from 0 to say k 2 max and here it goes to 0 to k 1 max. So, I could uh, make the transfer function 0 here, 0 here and then work out the addition. Of the. So, there, there are certain things, but directionality of the filters are a very uh, live issue and uh, in recent times, people are uh, using uh, filters in a much more creative and imaginative way that you can use the filter to do what is called as a large eddy simulation. I have uh, before also, large eddy simulation uh, basically tells you the following that uh, if you are solving a flow problem, let us say, and if uh, energy spectrum, then uh, say a typical energy spectrum would look like this. And you are, so, that means you have to resolve satisfactorily all the way to where the energy decays to 0, right. But suppose your computing power is limited, uh, you, you can only resolve up to this satisfactorily. Then what you would like to do? You would like to put in a, some kind of a artificial uh, uh, sink here, sink of energy. What it would do is it will try to reproduce the energy spectrum as it is up to the resolved scale and then it would decay. Down. So, then you will go back and tell uh, your peer group that look, I have been able to resolve the energy spectrum up to some range and you should trust only this part of the result. These are numerical attributes and this is what is called as a large eddy simulation. Uh, you may have heard of, that is what people call it, LES. Okay, this is a very standard technique for, uh, it is not really standard in the sense it is up and coming, people are investing lot of uh, um, thought to this. So, filters actually can be used for larger simulation, because I, I, I can now see that if this is my uh, original energy spectrum and then I pass the spectrum through a filter to force it to 0 here. So, that is the your Nyquist limit for your calculation. So, that is what you and this is where uh, uh, filters are becoming uh, very, very important. I mean uh, we are doing, we are doing some of this work here. Okay. So, does that answer your question of the directionality of filters?
next, this one, next one. Ah, <laughs> what we are showing this, this is the experimental uh, data, okay. These are experimental flow visualization data by, these are, these are basically vortices, these are vortices that you are seeing. So, this cylinder is doing this. So, you see this is a, uh, this appears to be a very uh, a simple geometry, but the flow here is very, very complex, because uh, if this is oscillating in a uh, rotary manner, then for some time the flow on the surface, you are uh, introducing a sort of a induced velocity, which is against the outer flow. The outer flow is going from, let us say, left to right. Okay. So, what happens is, you are doing something like your separation. I do not know if you are familiar with, uh, you may have done a course on fluid mechanics. If you have done, you may have heard of boundary layer separation. So, here uh, on, let us say, when this is going in the anticlockwise direction, the top part, what will do? We are actually inducing a separation, because the flow wants to go from left to right, and we are imposing a motion which takes it from right to left. So, flow actually separates and that causes this vortex to be released. If you look at your uh, book, you will find that if this was not rotating, it was stationary, then the separation point would be here, past the midnight. It should be about 108 degrees to 130, 40 degrees in that range. But here it is almost happening 90 degrees or even before. If you see, the separation begins pretty early. So, what happens is, half the cycle this releases and another half of the cycle this vortices are released. So, these are, this looks like your Penard uh, von Karman vortex street, where you have a set of uh, vortices of one side sign on top, the other, the other sign on the bottom, right. So, this is your experimental data. This is what uh, we have computed. Uh, for this case, the Reynolds number is pretty low, 150, that is where the experimental data is. We have also computed it for much higher Reynolds number, but this is perhaps uh, more uh, feasible, because Reynolds number is low, flow is two dimensional, the calculation method is two dimensional. Uh, this basically tells you the amplitude of oscillation. Amplitude, And uh, this uh, last factor is basically the uh, frequency, frequency of shedding. That is more than what it is for uh, the normal uh, shedding of a stationary cylinder. So, we could do a calculation uh, without using any filter, we get this. Then what we, uh, what we have done, um, what we have done here is basically, we have done the same calculation, but now we have used a, a filter, uh, which is sixth order. Okay? It has been done in two phase. We have used a kind of a uh, azimuthal filter only for the 30 lines. Now, you know why you did it for 30 lines. We did not want to do it for full domain. Then this vortices, uh, these vortices would have been smeared in the theta direction. We wanted to filter this azimuthal direction only very close to the surface. So, it is almost like only working inside the boundary layer. That is what we did. And while we have used a sixth order radial filter for the full domain. Okay. This was done uh, specifically to show that your filter should not really again uh, interfere with the physical nature of the flow. That is why you will find that these two pictures are completely indistinguishable. Uh, so, that, that may mean that, um, uh, let us say, if get by taking, let us say, say, few 500 points by 500 points in the domain. Uh, with the filter, I should be able to do it with fewer points. Okay, so th that you can uh, use the filter for. No, I never said that. I said it will not do anything provided you use central filter where T imaginary is zero. If you have T imaginary non-zero, then it changes the dispersion relation. Also, right? You can work. Uh, 
I, I completely did not comprehend what you said. Yes. Fine. Attenuate, yes, right. Uh -huh. Convection equation is non-dispersive because uh, your group velocity is equal to the phase speed. Say any other convection equation other than linear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is what you are seeing here, what you just now said that the equation is there. So, this is the central filter, this part and this is the upwind part. Please uh, allow me to correct this. This is not a fourth order term, this is a fifth order term. So, this is uh, once again uh, needs correction here. So, this is not a fourth order term, it is basically a fifth order term. So, it actually alters, uh, introduces T imaginary. See by itself, if I did not have this last term, it would be central. So, I will have T imaginary 0, but by adding this asymmetric uh, filtering here, we have actually um, brought in T imaginary, that is uh, probably uh, is shown here, yeah, this is the T imaginary part. And it is very interesting that um, you can, this is a fifth order filter, so it uh, uh, modifies your j equal to 5 to n minus 4 point along this solid line, right. So, so, what it does actually then, it introduces a t imaginary, changes the dispersion relation and this is what we uh, seen, ah, this is, this is what we see. Suppose I do not add that path, this is my uh, group velocity uh, contour in k h n c plane. Huh? And we can see this is that border line for which V g is 0. So, above which we have a spurious upstream propagating waves and this is almost like the rotary oscillation case. You see, the signal wants to go let us say from left to right, but numerically you are inducing something which is going from right to left and this could be a disaster if you are solving a uh, flow equation uh, like what we do in fluid dynamics. Then you do not really want this, this is a bad attribute of this uh, method. Okay. So, what we did, we added that upwinded part of the filter with the coefficient as your additional degree of freedom. We have small quantum of uh, that uh, fifth derivative term and what we find that this line actually does not intersect the KH plane, it actually rolls over. So, you have a strip, strip means a very small range of NC here circumvent that uh, Q wave uh, formation. Okay. <clears throat> so, sh shall we uh, go over to something else, if you, if you wish to discuss anything? Uh, yes, Mansi, you have some question? No? Uh, okay. Uh, Paul, decide for yourself. I, I, I thought if you may have some question on error analysis or uh, compact scheme, we could uh, discuss. And as I told you at the beginning, error analysis, okay. You want me to open that page? <laughs> Almost, this is the last slide. <laughs> no, I will, yeah, yeah. Oh, you have to read the paper. <laughs> We, we have uh, defined uh, there. You see what happens here, that will actually, it is not difficult for you to uh, work it out. If you read the paper, uh, this is where it would be. See, um, if I have a discontinuous solution, well, maybe I should, that would, uh, huh. if I look at this, what uh, drives error? These are the three essential ingredients. One is uh, the phase error path, that means if C n is not equal to C, then this will contribute, but that is also dependent upon 
the solution gradient. Hmm. So, this is this part that is uh, um, uh, due to both phase error as well as solution discontinuity, if there are that this will come into play. So, the second term we have talked about this is due to dispersion error. So, if you are V g n and C n are not coincident then you will get this term and this is our stability part. So, if you now go back to that picture, uh, yeah, we have purposely taken uh, this convection of this ram because we wanted to create a solution discontinuity here at the foot and at the shoulder of this ram and that is where you see from both this uh, region uh, errors actually appear. Okay. So, what happens this error uh, appears in the sense that 1 minus c n by c into del u and del x provides the seed and once that uh, provides the seed across a whole range of k then your dispersion error also comes into picture. So, these two peaks actually correspond to those two sources of error. One corresponds to phase error, another corresponds to dispersion error. But simply looking at in the physical plane, you do not get the feel of it, but if you go, go to the spectral plane, k plane, uh, then you can see that these are two distinct peaks, those are uh, caused by those peaks. Yes, Oh, how do you get from there that, uh, well, um, no, I do not have a ready made answer for it, you. I do not think uh, we can analytically show it, it has to be worked out. You have to compute it and plot it and check for yourself, but for sure, um, if you, you, you can at least show it for explicit schemes. See, the problem I am not venturing. Uh, to give a ready made answer to you is because C is itself A inverse B. So, if I at least take a uh, explicit scheme A is identity. So, by looking at B matrix you can work it out. Okay. So, the B matrix is if it is symmetric then you multiply then you should be able to show that if it is symmetric you will not have any imaginary uh, contribution coming from that product. You followed what I said? See, basically you uh, are saying that I k equivalent is summation of C L j and the uh, C k L, L going from 1 to n. Now, C by itself uh, There is nothing but uh, A inverse B. So, if I uh, look at uh, explicit schemes, uh, for that A is the identity matrix and then what you are going to get is I k equivalent would be simply equal to uh, well. What is P j L? It is nothing but e to the power i k uh, um, x L minus x j. Okay. <clears throat> now, if I uh, take this as uh, to be a symmetric matrix and then I take a product of this, you will see the imaginary part will uh, be identical. Um, hold on, because if this is i k equivalent you have to see the correspondingly what you are going to get. So, uh, this you can take it out, okay. now you can draw your conclusion.
So, the real part will turn out to be 0, right? You will get that i sin k h by k type of term. If you, if you think of let us say C D 2, that is what you would get. Right? Well, any other questions on this? that I would like to close here by giving some of my thoughts to you. I have spent almost 40 hours in this room with you. So, I, I, I wanted to make the subject as simple as possible. If it is not, these are the excuses. Uh, uh, it must be made difficult. You do not just do not want to uh, sell it through the local pawn shop, right? It has to be, uh, it has to have some class. Uh, it is true, but uh, we, we, we try to understand what it is. Hmm? And I am sure if we claim IITs are like Harvard and Cambridge of India, we should be able to do it, right? Uh, we should have the confidence to surmount the difficulties and uh, enjoy the glory, right? So, these are the philosophers speaking. Oh, these are some common sense things. Hmm? Well, let me make some clear observations. These are taken mostly from Tom Paine, you know the person who is responsible for writing, one of the author of American constitution. Uh, Tom Paine was a great thinker. So, he actually talked about certain things about science. So, I thought they will be of interest to you. Every science has for its basis a system of principles as fixed. Whether you are there or not, the science is there, right? So, it does not depend on the observer with the apology to the quantum mechanics guys, right? We, we say the observer is not important here. The things will go on happening. So, we cannot make principles. We can only find it out, right? That that is what we do. We, whether your error equation is right or wrong, we do not even quibble about it. It is there. When you compute, you see it is there. So, there are people who quibble with us. I said to them this. But we are not discovering, we are just simply pointing out that this is possible, right? Uh, another thing is uh, this modern tendency to chalta hai attitude, huh? a moderately good thing is okay, right? Lots of uh, you actually spend a lifestyle which is uh, reflective of that, but that is not what he said. It is not really good enough. Hmm? The third thing relates to this course is. Uh, you know, uh, I, I have uh, not only this time, many a times I have uh, students come up to me and say, oh, you say this uh, von Neumann analysis is wrong. We have been taught all these years and then we have all along thought it is right. So, that is what it is, you know. It is a, it's a habit forming. If you uh, thinking something is right, it appears to be right, but it is not right. So, that is the issue that a long habit of thinking a thing is wrong, uh, if it not thinking it is wrong, gives it a superficial appearance. So, I, I, I suppose uh, all I am saying is that be reasonable, be analytic. Do not accept anything just because I stand here and I say something and you will have to accept that that is right. I always encouraged, I always invited you to uh, ask probing questions, right? So, that is that's what uh, will be a reasonable thing to do. Now, talking about algorithms, right? Uh, what we do in science is uh, trying to do something new, right? So, this is uh, how many of you know of this author? Uh, no, I think it is probably from the, pre the, uh, the first class. What is that? Breaking? Tipping point. Uh, I think it is from the tipping point or maybe in one of his article in New Yorker, I do not know where it is, but he said it, that you cannot really say how to invent things. You know, like our uh, honorable minister says, IITs are not producing uh, Nobel laureates, as if there is some formula and you pour in some central fund and Nobel laureate comes out from the other end, right? So, this is not, so we do not have the algorithm. But uh, what we know, what is needed are these elements. We need to have good people, right? So, they would have something to contribute. 
and the people should have also the passion to do it. You, you, you should be almost obsessive about doing things, that I have to do it. This obsession is there. And this is the luck element, huh? serendipity. I have told you before that there are scientists who got Nobel Prize but did not know for what they have got it. This uh, scientist from the lab, uh, the background radiation uh, they found out. You know about this word serendipity? Yeah? That serendip is the modern day Sri Lanka, right? So that is called, is to be called Swarnadip. So from that the Britishers have coined this word called serendipity. So they were looking for India, they reached uh, Sri Lanka and found it is full of emeralds, right? So when you actually unexpectedly discover something, that is your serendipity, okay? So that is that. And this is something that God gives you, you know, epiphany. You are inspired by something. So if you are not inspired, then probably you would have one missing element of it. And there you have it. So I, I suppose uh, we will edit this out, but <laughs> I wish I could send it to our minister to say that we have been talking about algorithms for 40 uh, lectures almost, but we still have not found out how to come out with uh, an algorithm for creating a novel life. <laughs> so that is that. And Ah, this is the last word again by Kierkegaard. You have to live in the present, but you will only appreciate when you look at it in the distance uh, ahead and then you will see whether anything that is done at present makes any sense or not. Okay? So I think uh, I have said enough. It is a long uh, semester, like you can say that every nightmare comes to an end with the daybreak, right? So the, with the end semester probably this dose of course also should come to an end. So I will stop here. Okay.